Most marathon advice online is outdated or flat out wrong. I'm a sports scientist, physiotherapist and former professional triathlete. And in this video, I'll show you exactly how to train, fuel, pace and plan your week to get the fastest time possible based on real science, not guesswork. So what does it actually take to run a faster marathon? Or put another way, how much should you train and how long should your longest run B. A study from 2020 asked that exact question. They looked at how training volume and the longest endurance run relate to performance and running related injuries in recreational marathon runners. They found that runners averaging more than 65 kilometers per week had significantly faster marathon finish times with an improvement of around 14 minutes compared to those running less than 40 kilometers per week. On the other hand, a weekly training volume below 40 kilometers was linked to slower finish times with an average increase of about six minutes. Also, the runners whose longest training run was less than 25 kilometers had slower marathon times averaging around 13 minutes longer than those whose longest run was longer than 25 kilometers. But won't you get more injured from running more and longer? Well, the study found no significant association between training volume or the length of the longest run and the occurrence of running related injuries. So the study basically found that you can train more and have longer training runs without increasing your injury risk. So what's the takeaway? Averaging more than 65 kilometers per week will make your marathon time significantly faster. Training less than 40 kilometers per week will make your marathon time significantly slower. In general, the more volume, the better, as long as it's built up slowly over time. The longest training run should be over 25 kilometers to make sure you get the fastest finish time possible. And if you progress slowly, then having more volume and longer training runs won't necessarily increase your injury risk. Other things like fueling and the right recovery plan play a much bigger role. So now we know how much to train to run a faster marathon, but what should that training look like? You've probably heard about training zones before, and maybe even concepts like periodization and the 80-20 rule. But what does that actually mean when you're training for a full marathon? Here's the thing. Marathon training is not just about running more. It's about running smarter. And that means knowing not just how far or how fast to run, but how hard. And how hard you're running is called training zones. So let's break this down and look at how it relates to a marathon. In the world of endurance training, you'll see everything from three training zones to nine training zones. But when it comes to improve your marathon time, you only really need to understand three. These three training zones are separated by two important thresholds. Think of them like checkpoints in your internal Engine. So when you start running, you start building up what's called lactate in your blood. And at some point, your body can't clear the lactate fast enough, so it'll start accumulating like this. This is called the aerobic threshold, or the first lactate threshold. LT1. Then you run even harder and at some point lactate will start to accumulate a lot faster like this. This is called the anaerobic threshold or the second lactate threshold LT2. LT1 is where you're still burning mostly fat, running smooth and not building up much fatigue. LT2 is where lactate really starts to accumulate and now you're in this unsustainable territory. See how these two lines at LT1 and LT2 divide our training into three different zones. Zone 1, which is below LT1, this is your easy runs. Zone 2, which is between LT1 and LT2, this is steady efforts and most marathons live in this zone. Zone 3, which is above LT2, this is your VO2 max work and hard intervals and speed. If you have seen any running content online, then you've probably seen them refer to five zones. When that's the case, it's because they divide zone one and zone two into four zones like this to have a bit more room to adjust. But here's the twist. It's not about what training zones you're training in. It's about when and how you shift between them. And that's the real key to a faster marathon. And that's where what's called training intensity distribution and periodization comes in. Now, don't worry if this sounds complicated. I'll try to make it simple. Training intensity distribution is just a fancy way of saying how much time we spend in each zone. We call it TID for short. Periodization is more about how your training evolves over time so that you peak on race day and not in training. Because here's the thing, 
If you stick to just one training zone, so you run easy all the time, or you push your threshold all the time, then you will either undertrain and underperform, or you might overtrain and burn out. And the marathon demands balance. So instead of just repeating the same training structure every single week, smart marathon runners, they plan their training in four different phases. During what's called the base phase, you might train mostly in zone one. So easy runs, and long, slow runs, just to build up that aerobic base. This is where what's called a pyramidal training intensity distribution fits right in. A pyramidal TID is 80% zone 1, 15% zone 2, and 5% zone 3. The next phase is the build phase, where you gradually increase your intensity. This is where we start to see a lot of zone 2 work, or if you use a 5 zone model, zone 3 and zone 4, to train that marathon pace. In this phase, you could use what's called a threshold. TID. So spending around 55 to 60 percent in zone one and above 35 percent in zone two and less than five percent in zone three. In the final peak phase we want to sharpen that fitness so we might introduce a bit more zone three work. Now we're not looking to build endurance we've already done that in the last two phases but now we want to sharpen our fitness and improve our running economy. What's called an 80-20 model works wonders here where we we do 80% of our work in zone 1 and then 20% in zone 3. Or oh, well, 15 to 20% in zone 3 because we have to go through zone 2 to get to zone 3. And then comes the taper phase where our volume drops but our intensity stays. This phase usually starts around 21 days before the marathon and then you cut your volume gradually down to around 50% of what you were doing before the taper phase. An 80-20 model works wonders here as well. The goal is just to freshen up up and absorb all the training. This evolving strategy is what's called periodization and it has been proven time and time again by science to be superior to just training the same thing each and every week. But here's where it gets interesting because a recent study showed that there's one type of training that needs to be different depending on how fast you run. And that is the one thing that most runners ignore even though it makes them run faster and less likely to get injured. Let me explain. A systematic review from 2024 found that although both high load strength training and plyometric training improve running economy, plyometric training might be more effective at lower speeds of less than 12 kilometers per hour. On the other hand, high load strength training might be particularly effective in improving running economy in athletes with a high VO2 max and at high running speeds. So what does that mean? It means that if you have to prioritize your training between plyometrics, which is basically just jumping, and high load strength training, then it depends on how fast of a runner you are. If you're running slower than 12 kilometers per hour, then you should probably dedicate some time to plyometric training. But if you run faster than 12 kilometers per hour, it is probably better to spend some time doing heavy strength training. But now you're probably wondering, okay, so how much of this training should I do then? Well, to be honest, just doing something is better than nothing. In fact, a study showed that just doing five minutes of plyometric training per day can make you significantly faster. But to get the most out of it, aim for at least twice per week and no more than three times per week if your goal is to run a faster marathon. But to be honest, just doing one strength training session per week will help you a ton. If you want a full strength training protocol to go along with your running, then check out the link in the description below. Okay, so now we know how to train for a marathon, but how do we make sure that we don't make the number one mistake that runners make that completely wreck race day, which is to not pace your marathon correctly? Let's look at what the science say. This scientific review from 2024 looked at how runners pace their speed during marathons and the different factors influencing these strategies. They identified four different pacing strategies. A positive pacing strategy, so starting the race fast and slowing down towards the end. This was the most observed strategy among runners. An even pacing strategy, so maintaining a consistent speed throughout the race. A negative pacing strategy, which is beginning at a slower pace and then speeding up in the later stages. And what's called parabolic pacing, which is when speed varies up and down at different points. Even though the review doesn't prescribe a perfect universal pacing strategy for everyone, here's what they recommend. Positive pacing usually leads to early fatigue and poorer performance. And it's the most common mistake among recreational runners. Doing 
even pacing or slightly negative pacing are in general linked to better marathon performances. So how do you pace your marathon? Start slower than you think you need to. You have not magically become a marathon runner who can run 15 minutes faster than you plan to. Stick to the plan. Then try to maintain a steady pace or even a slightly faster pace towards the second half of the race. And then use a pacing strategy based on your fitness level, of course, but also on the weather conditions and the course profile. But how do you know your perfect pace? Can you use your heart rate as a guideline, like most people online say? Not really. Even though some studies have reported elite marathon runners to have an average heart rate of 82 to 88% of their max, a study from 2022 challenged that statement. They found that heart rate doesn't accurately reflect how hard your body is working during a marathon at least not for recreational runners. The researchers showed that as the marathon goes on, heart rate stays high, but oxygen consumption, or VO2, actually drops. In simple terms, your heart rate might say, I'm working so hard, but your legs, they're actually backing off. So if you're relying on your heart rate to pace your marathon, then it might actually be lying to you especially in the second half. Now, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean to ditch your heart rate monitor. I wear one myself. It just means to maybe not let it make all the decisions. So if we can't rely on heart rate alone, then how do we pace our marathon? A study from 2022 looked at hundreds of runners and found something surprisingly simple. Your weekly mileage and your average training pace are enough to give a pretty accurate prediction of your marathon finish time. It's called Tanda pacing and it's named after a study from 2011. And here's the crazy part. If you run between 2 hours and 47 minutes and 3 hours and 36 minutes, marathon times were predicted with just a 5 minute error. That's pretty accurate for something that does not require a fancy lab test. If you run faster than 2 hours and 47 minutes, then it becomes less accurate, but it's still a great starting point. So how do you calculate your pace? Start by tracking your weekly running distance and your average pace for several weeks. Then plug those values into a Tanda-based calculator. You can find them with a quick Google search. You can use that predicted marathon time to guide your pacing, but you won't keep your pace for long without the right fueling and hydration strategy. Because because to be honest, this is where most first time marathoners go wrong and it can make or break your race. So how do you fuel to run the fastest marathon time possible? A scientific review from 2017 found that carbs are the fastest and most efficient energy source for high intensity running. That means that if you want to run a faster marathon, carbs are your best friend. So how much do you need? Research from 2011 found that for events longer than two and a half hours, having an intake of up to 90 grams per hour is beneficial. But it's important to note that the ability to absorb carbs is trainable, and in my experience with the runners I work with, they usually have a hard time just getting up to 30 to 60 grams per hour. But it's important to train, because if you can absorb more, you'll have more energy, and that's a huge advantage. But what types of carbohydrates should we eat then. The best combination of carbohydrates is a 2 to 1 glucose to fructose. This combination has been shown to speed up absorption and avoid stomach issues. Most sports drinks and energy gels follow this recommendation, so if you go with any of the major brands, you're pretty much home safe. But none of this will help you if you don't have your hydration and your electrolytes dialed in. So what's the perfect hydration strategy for a marathon? Let me just come straight out and say it. Dehydration slows you down big time. Research has found that even a 2% drop in body weight due to sweat will decrease your speed and power output. So how much do we actually need? Aim for 35 to 45 milliliters per kilogram of body weight per day, especially in the days leading up to your race. Then add around 500 to 750 milliliters per hour of your marathon, depending on your sweat rate and how hot it is. As you can probably imagine, this means eating and drinking a lot during your marathon. On top of that, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends 300 to 600 milligrams of sodium per hour during prolonged exercise and 100 to 200 milligrams of potassium per hour to support muscle contractions. So now you're probably wondering, but when should I eat? Does that actually matter? Yeah. 
What you eat and when you eat it will directly impact your marathon performance. So here's a simple way to approach when and what you eat on race day. Two to three hours before your marathon, eat the following. One to four grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight and about 10 to 20 grams of protein for muscle support. Go low on fats to avoid digestion issues. About 30 to 60 minutes before your race, start your fueling strategy. So if you're going for 60 grams per hour, start then. During the race, eat the following. Aim for 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour with a two to one ratio of glucose to fructose. It could be gels, it could be energy drinks, whatever works the best for you. But the more you can absorb, the better. So train yourself to get closer to that 90 grams per hour mark. Get small amounts of sodium, maybe 300 to 500 milligrams per hour, and then a bit of potassium as well. But please don't try to do all of this on race day, because that's how you ruin your marathon time by going straight to the toilet. You need to practice this in training multiple times. Never try anything new on race day. Trust me, I speak from bitter experience. So how do you practice your nutrition plan? The way I do it is that in the two to four weeks before the race, then I'll have a session that mirrors that race pace effort where I'll try everything. So for the marathon, it'll typically be a long run. Then I'll try everything. So my gear, my nutrition strategy, my hydration, and then I'll adjust the week after. So I'll have a second session where I'll try to dial everything in perfectly. And you have to include this specific brand that you'll be using on race day. So make sure to check up on wherever you're going. What type of brand are they going to be handing out at the aid stations? That's what you should be practicing with. And make sure to have two sessions because even though I've done this for like 15 years, there's always something that I need to adjust. And if this is the first time you'll do it, you'll notice that you have to drink and eat a lot and where should you have your gels and how do you eat when you're running? All of these things are so important to have a strategy for. And the marathon is truly an eating competition as much as it is an endurance event. But what about supplements? Are there any you can take to run faster on race day? Yes. A scientific review from 2024 found two supplements that are the most effective in helping you perform during a marathon. Nitrates, which is found in beetroot juice, can enhance your performance by increasing oxygen delivery to your muscles. The recommended dosage is around 500 milligrams taken two to three hours before your race. Caffeine increases your time to exhaustion. Effective doses range from three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight, typically taken an hour before your race. And to be honest, for most runners, caffeine is all you really need to see a huge improvement. Okay, so how do we put all this information together into a weekly training schedule? Let me show you an example of a marathon plan in the last week of the peak phase. For this specific week, I've used a pyramidal intensity distribution with 80% easy, 15% medium and 5% hard. And the key session of the week is the Sunday long run. This will also be the testing day. Screenshot it and use it as inspiration to build your own training plan. So how do you run a faster marathon? Aim for more than 65 kilometers of training per week with your longest run being more than 25 kilometers per week. Use base, build, peak and taper phases. Change your training intensity distribution as you move through the phases. If you run slower than 12 kilometers per hour, then prioritize plyometric training. If you're faster, then do heavy strength training. And one to two sessions per week can make a big difference. Go out a little slower than your goal pace and then aim for that even or even a slightly negative pacing strategy. Look up the Tanda formula to estimate your time. Fuel will make or break your race. Train yourself to be able to absorb 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour using a mixture of two to one of glucose to fructose. Stay hydrated with water and electrolytes. Supplement with caffeine and beetroot juice. Practice everything in training, not on race day. But you're still missing one key component if you want to run the fastest marathon time possible and avoid injuries in the process. And I'm going to show you exactly what that is and how to fix it in this video right here.